Hello. 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 Field that I've been diving into uh, like the last year or so, I've been done, doing a couple of projects around this theme, and it's now crystallizing uh, into a story that I want to work out more and do more with. Also, not just this semester, but also next semester. So it's going to be a bigger, a bigger project, so to say. Um, so let's get started. So for the like coming 45 minutes or so, I will talk you through. The first part of the three parts, um, the part on learning to die, and uh, uh, then I'll open for uh, we'll open for for discussion, and we'll see where where we land things. So we are facing climate change, and if I get the prognosis right, um, we are facing the end of the world. Um, the world as we know it will no longer exist in a foreseeable future. I don't know exactly what the future is going to bring. No one knows what the future is going to bring. I don't claim that I know exactly what is going to happen. But it seems remarkably unlikely um, that we can have a stable uh, rolling out of a history uh, that is sort of a linear story as we've had a sort of in the last decennium. We're going to see massive changes so profound and so um, intense that the world as we know it uh, will no longer exist. The end of the world is not necessarily the end of us. The end of the world is not necessarily the end of the planet. Um, but something fundamental will have to change. And this is the beginning of a new era. And this is the era of the Anthropocene. Anthropocene is the geological era in which the Earth's crust, for the first time in the planet's history, is becoming determined by humans as the main factor on it. While simultaneously, humans are going to be determined by nature in completely novel ways that we haven't seen before. So nature and humans, who always somehow live together in a complex way, are, we're going to become codependent in new, uh, new styles, new ways. Um, and we don't know what that's going to bring. The most surprising thing here is that we've been so blind. That we saw it coming, somehow, and simultaneously, we didn't. Right. So this is fascinating. Uh, we're 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 now confronted with a climate crisis that is not a new discovery. We've been knowing this for decades and decades, at least since 1973. Uh, but knowing and knowing apparently is two. We've been having ways of knowing that blinded us to what was really going on. And Bruno Latour, who, who I'm using a lot of material from uh, for this lecture, he puts it like this. We moderns, we have been willingly blind to limits. We grabbed land, abused it, ignoring chimes of doom. And now, under the ground of private property, of land grabs, another ground has started moving. There is something moving, and we don't know what it is, because we can't see it because it's underground. It is sort of, it is moving in ways that we can't see. And we can't see because we're with our heads in the clouds. We have a sort of a cultural way of being um, that makes us very inept, very blind to reading nature. We have to come, as Bruno Latour puts it, back to Earth. So we're facing climate anxiety. We're facing climate fear. And we're responding to that in all kinds of ways. One 
line of responding to climate anxiety is politicization. We politicize it. We make it a political battle. And then we have a tremendous clash growing now between, on one hand, a sort of a denialist retreat movement that wants to get away from the dangers of the future, climate change, migration, whatever, by, by withdrawing behind walls, withdrawing, withdrawing on islands, withdrawing on, on safe spaces. Um, this is what we see happening in, in Trump, in Brexit, in, in Brazil. Simultaneously, you see another politicization, where the politicization becomes what they call eco-authoritarianism, which is a sense of acuteness um, of the crisis, such that the increasing amount of people are going to say, listen, um, we're not going to wait for consensus. We're not going to wait until everybody sort of agrees that we're going to make changes. We have to push those changes through right away, regardless of whether there's a majority for it or not. So those two camps are, are splitting and moving uh, towards uh, extreme positions quite fast. Simultaneously, there's a depolitization movement that goes completely the other way that tries to say, let's keep this out of the political. Let's keep it nice. Let's keep it overseeable. This is where we have a whole sustainability discourse, which is all about greening things, about putting windmills, uh, by, by technological solutions. Um, a lot of techno-optimism is there. Um, the idea needs to be, yeah, if we, if we can keep it non-political, it needs to be win, 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 win. Right? And then, then we can keep it out of political bickering. Unfortunately for the people in the depolitization movement, it doesn't seem to be working so well anymore. You see a repolitization uh, um, of all those attempts to stabilize uh, our approach towards climate change, to make it non-political. Why is that? Well. There's a lot of reasons, but one of the most fundamental one is um, skepsis about science. Uh, we used to have, like 30, 40 years ago, a massive consensus about scientific knowledge and its status and its authority. And there was sort of an uncontested ground on the basis of which both sides of all sides would sort of agree. So you could use it as an, as an authority. Uh, but now what we see happening is that science um, is being questioned in all camps. Right. Uh, uh, under sort of the, the right-wing camp, you see that, that climate China, the science is being questioned, but on the progressive side, you see, for instance, that vaccinations are being questioned. Both sides uh, question science. Um, so science is no longer the automatic authority that, that allows for non-political solutionism. Um, and that creates um, a, a problem for the depolitization move. So we're living in times of increasing polarization, of politicization, where, where we're struggling to dampen the dynamics. And we see the camps splitting into directions that are not going to be very pleasant. Everybody is scared. Everybody is scared about the future. Um, but everybody withdraws in sort of their own camps. And fear doesn't typically bring out the most beautiful side. Of humans. Um, what we see is a radical politicization. Um, and I, like I said, I can't look into the future. But I'm not sure if in 20 or 30 years we're going to have nice liberal democracies like we have now. Uh, I'm not sure whether our consensus models are going to hold those societal tensions. <coughs> um, now it sort of works, but the pressure is mounting. But if we have migration flows coming to this, uh, we have to invest billions and billions in order to, to keep our feet dry. I'm not sure what it's going to happen. But even this whole story is not exactly getting the point, at least not the point that I want to bring forth tonight. Because the repolitization of climate change is still missing out on one thing. Nature itself has become a political actor. So we have to start understanding nature in completely different terms as to see how it has become political. Um, and therefore, we need a more fundamental approach to start rereading what nature is. 
typically we do this kind of moves by making a split between realism and idealism, where the idealists are on the side of nature, and then the realists are on the side of the economy, uh, or on the side of how things really are. That, that distinction doesn't work anymore. Um, we cannot be either realist or idealist anymore. Idealism has not been able to stop this from happening. But realism also never was realist real to begin with. Um, the projects that we have mounted in our society as realistic, our economic projects, <coughs> our, our societal projects, exactly, they were never realistic to begin with. They were unsustainable to begin with. Bruno Latour puts it like this, how can we deem realistic a project of modernization that has forgotten for two centuries to anticipate the reaction of the globe to human actions. If our science, if our economical science has been completely blind to what is happening now, um, how can we deem that to be a realistic project? This is the context I want to speak to. And this is what I want to, I want to, I want to crack open a little bit. Um, I don't want to focus on how to get out of this puzzle. I want to understand this puzzle as a transformative puzzle. We need to learn to become something that we're not. And that what we're not is going to be both more human and more nature. This is going to be a reinvention, uh, somehow, of human nature. This is not going back. We're not going to undo um, being modern, somehow, because modernity always breaks down everything that is not modern. We cannot go back without romanticizing some past, which never was there. But we can transform. And transformation takes the form, and the metaphors that I use for that are, are dying, rebirth, and then a new way of living. Those three steps are going to be the way I organize these lectures. So if we step into the dying part now. If you want to die, well, if you're going to die, you um, you got to let hope go of hope. Hope is going to be your enemy. Uh, because hope is going to be the thing that is constantly draw away your attention from what is actually happening. You are going to die. Right. This, what we're facing, is not something we can avoid. We cannot... Um, uh, realistically say that we're going to wing our way out of this. We're, we're gonna, not going to uphold this lifestyle. So we have to <clears throat> let go of that hope somehow so that we can start seeing something new in this situation. <coughs> and the other problem with our hopes is that our hope typically takes the form of solutionism. And solutionism is actually the logic that got us here in the first place. There's something wrong with how we solve things. Um, so we have to tackle that at a deeper level. So we have to learn another sort of approach. Uh, Latour calls it, we've got to learn to dishope. Um, that's not despair. That's something else. But let go of hope so that we start facing something that we're actually too scared to face. A form of death. Royce Granton puts it like this. If Montaigne, uh, as Montaigne asserted, to philosophize is to learn how to die, then we have entered humanity's most philosophical age. We have now to start coming to terms with who we are, where we're coming from, and how the hell uh, we're going we're gonna to respond to that. And that comes through a facing of death. Facing death <coughs> isn't 
about physical demise, isn't about the end of the body. Facing death is about confronting your own limits, the end of you. Martin Heidegger, a philosopher that I'm, who I'm very fond of, um, uh, speaks about death as the thing that makes us human authentic. Because it's only when we look at ourselves from the perspective of, of our own death that we start seeing what we really, really value in life. Sometimes I, I do an exercise with students where I ask students to write their own obituary. And, uh, and that, is, that, that always brings uh, some, uh, some awkwardness in the room. Uh, but you know what they never write? They never write, oh, this is me in my grave. I had such a great career, and everybody loved me, and I had a shitload of money, and all that status. No, no one, no one writes that. What they want to write about their own life is something like, you know, that person really cared about stuff, really cared about people, really focused on meaningful things. It is the confrontation with your own death that makes you see what life is really about. So this is what, what Heidegger calls being onto death, or being to the, towards death. So then the question is, how do we let things die? What, how does that process work? Um, and a later question will be, what exactly needs to die? Scranton puts it like this. The greatest challenge we face is understanding that this civilization is already dead. To let things die is mostly just to recognize that something is already dead. If you've ever had a relationship <coughs> where you broke up, you probably recall that there was a whole period in which you tried to resuscitate it, uh, bring it back to life somehow, n not trying to look at it into the eye that the thing was already, the relationship was already gone. Um, and, and only uh, when you start realizing that, when you start letting it go, you saw it had been dead for a long time already. That is what it means to let die. And this is why we have to let go somehow of our solutionist mindset, which is all about trying to resuscitate, trying to keep alive somehow. Scranton talks about, um, uh, about uh, Western society also in terms of zombie system. It still moves, but there is no life in it anymore. It does a lot of stuff, it does a shitload of stuff, but it's not really alive. So what does that mean? Well, learning to die as a civilization, he says, means letting go of this particular way of life and its identities, and its ideas of identity, freedom, success, and progress. So learning to die, learning to let die, is learning to let go of things that are already dead somehow. But what is it that needs to die? That's the most important thing for tonight. If you have, if you have ecosystems, if you have like complex systems like our social world, and if you take out one part because it's broken, the system will just replace it. It, 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 it doesn't, you can't repair a system like that because the system has a sort of a way of, of, of reinstituting itself. Um, the problems we're facing are not problems at the level of the parts of our civilization. The problem that we're facing is problem at the level of the whole. And for humans, the whole is always a story. We humans live in language. Language, Heidegger says, is the house of being. We have no other way of being than, than through our storytelling, through our narration, through the words that we give to things to experience. So the whole that we have, what our civilization stands for, what, what, what life stands for, somehow comes with stories about who we are and what, related, what nature is and what the planet is. And that's the level of where we have to start dying and changing. So we have to we have to confront our, our cosmology, the stories about who we are on this planet in this vast universe. 
or, or Latour calls it our, our cosmogram, the picture of, of the universe. And that cosmogram may be something that some of us are very much aware of, but often not even. It's just a background story against which we start doing things. So it may not even be very clear to us most of the time. Because it's the thing, that this cosmogram is the sort of the set of things that we assume before other things start becoming meaningful. It's the background uh, of, our, of our everyday stories. And the cosmogram that we're addressing here right now is particularly a Western cosmogram. A Western cosmogram that, that arose around the time 17th century, 18th century enlightenment period, and then became a, a modern story, a, storm, a story of modernity that spread around the globe, first through colonialism, and then through development, and then through globalization of free trade, um, which were all mechanisms that, that spread around a lot of stuff, but also a lot of stories, and that modernized the whole world that we know. That is the cosmogram that we're having. That cosmogram, Latour emphasizes, is a particularly religious one. All cosmograms are religious, in a way. They're always stories about who we humans are in a vast universe that we cannot oversee, um, and, and story about where we're coming from and where we're moving towards, and, and we don't know exactly. None of that <coughs> story can be corroborated, can be tested, because we cannot step outside our universe and, and check whether it's true or not. They're, they are metaphysical stories. They're religious stories about identity, uh, belonging, and becoming. So the Western cosmogram is religious like all of those stories, except that it pretends not to be. That's the one difference, right? The fact that it, that it doesn't have a deity uh, involved in the story makes it think it can stand out towards the others. But it is otherwise pretty much the same thing. And it comes from a very clear historical uh, tradition of thought. Uh, st starting with the ancient Greeks, uh, Plato, those kind of people. Um, and then through Christianity, it became a narrative of enlightenment and of science. Those stories are typically told as stories of change, of radical change, of revolution. But there, there is massive continuity between them. Um, so this is the, what the Western cosmogram is about. And this cosmogram, I'll get more into the details in a minute, is um, largely responsible for our relation, or particularly the breaking of our relation with nature. It is a cosmogram that, um, that has torn us loose from Earth in two main ways. On one level, it has lifted up, us up the position of the human above the earth, uh, in the clouds, so to say, um, in, in a world of abstractions. I'll get to that in a minute. And on the other hand, the cosmogram has reduced nature to mere things, to mere objects to be manipulated, to be used by humans. And from that picture, nature becomes simply an environment for us to act in. But we get to do whatever we want, and we're not part of nature. We're, we're somewhere above it. So where does this modern cosmogram come from? How does this, how does this evolve? The traditional Christian story was very simple. You had God. God created Earth, and then when he was done with that, uh, he created humans, um, and they sort of had an in-between position. The knower of everything is God, the planet is creation, and humans are a privileged species on the planet, a privileged being on the planet, but that have a particular task of being stewards. 
that have the task of stewarding the planet and being accountable to God for that stewarding. There was a similar relation of accountability there. But then, as Nietzsche points out, at some point, we killed God. And the throne became vacant. Um, so we looked around for a while who wanted to take the throne, and then apparently no one else wanted to do it. So we, uh, we decided to, to take that position. Um, meaning that we started understanding not God as a central figure in the universe, but ourselves. And that we started appropriating an understanding of the knowledge that we have of the world in terms of the godly knowledge that was there before, namely absolute knowledge. I'll get to that in a minute, but this is where modern science starts uh, and has a sort of an, an understanding of absolute knowledge. The tour puts it like this. You know, how, how close those two stories are actually still uh, to one another. The God that orders the religious views of the world bears a very close resemblance to the nature that orders the scientific view of the world. Three of their features are in fact exactly the same. Truth is external, universal, and indisputable. So this cosmogram had its first inklings in the early 17th century when Galileo Galileo um, um, discovered a completely new understanding of our universe, um, where the old story of the church had been that Earth had been created by God, therefore it has to be <coughs> the center of the universe. Um, and then the stars and the sun, etc., revolve around it. And uh, Galileo, of course, uh, showed that um, the Earth, uh, that that is not an accurate depiction of things, and actually that the Earth moves. And then the Inquisition forced him to revoke his views, and he duly did, but apparently he did so mumbling after his revocation, invocation, uh, and still, and yet it moves. Um, the Earth moves. That's where the innovation was of the birth of our modern cosmography. As we'll see in 10 minutes or so, the end of the same cosmogram will be, and the Earth is moved by us. But we'll get there. Galileo's innovation, the spectacular thing that he did, was his ability to see the Earth as, as he puts it, a falling body among falling bodies. The universe is just full of stars and planets and other kinds of rocks and whatever there is that is just falling along the lines of gravity. And this has become sort of the, the central story of modern science. Um, um, that there are simple laws of nature and then that things are merely bodies that follow those laws of nature. This has led, this viewpoint has led to a very particular weird understanding of nature. And this is where it really becomes interesting. Um, because in order to understand Earth as a body among falling bodies, Galileo first had to take out a shitload of movement from the planet in order to understand it like that. All the, this, the, the bursting that is going on on our planet, all the movements, the tectonic ones, the big ones, the small ones, all the, the plants, all the movement that is constantly uh, uh, determining our planet, he had to unthink them so that he could create a picture of the Earth where there's only one movement. Right? And to, in order to get to that one movement, he had to unthink all the other movements. That's the logic of it. And when he got there, what he was 
seeing was a beautiful story of cause and effect. The, law, the regular laws of nature. And in his story, the story that he got from that is that cause and effect are connected in a very interesting way. Namely, an effect is in itself never a cause. Um, if you have three billiard balls and you push one towards the next one and the second one goes to the third, none of the billiard balls do anything. They're just passive reciprocals of the first movement. Right? So the story of cause and effect, the story of what nature is, became sort of determined along the narrative of um, um, a first cause that set everything in motion, but then yeah, all the effects didn't actually do something. Nature in itself is a passive passing on from an ulterior of an ulterior force. Um, from there on, you get a clockwork kind of story of nature, a mechanism, which is very religious in a fascinating way. Uh, because it's not that different from the old religious story. God created the earth and then let it run. Or Aristotle uh, speaking about the, the, for the, un, the unmoved mover uh, that set whole, the, whole, the whole universe in working. Uh, and then Richard Dawkins, who tries to defend science along those lines, says, yeah, well, there's a, a, a blind clockmaker, uh, the Big Bang, uh, that, that set it in motion. But otherwise, once it was set in motion, everything that happened was sort of just a regular working out of cause, cause, cause and effect without anything really happening. Or, as Latour puts it, everything is in the cause, nothing in the effect. In other word, words, literally nothing happens. The passage of time does nothing to the world. There is no history. There is, in other words, no agency in nature. There is, in other words, no, no um, uh, role, no, no actorship in nature. So this has become the dominant view of nature. But there's more. Because where does Galileo look from when he says that the Earth is just a falling body among falling bodies. <coughs> because that's not when you see what you see when you are on Earth. <coughs> right? On, if you're on Earth, you see the stars moving. So what the invention of Galileo was, was to inhabit a positionality that was not on Earth, through which he could see Earth as a fallen body among fallen bodies. He inhabited what they called the view from nowhere. And that view from nowhere is exactly how we prefer to read nature. Uh, as far detached as possible uh, from the position of, we'll get to the objectivity um, um, and, and neutrality. This does something very weird with us, because actually we're never <coughs> there. We're never nowhere. We're never neutral. We're always within a project, with a purpose, with a context, with a background, with, with, with societal needs. All that stuff is always there. Right? But that's not how we read ourselves. So we got a, we got a story about science here that is very different than what science actually does. Science always takes place within settings, with actual engagements with people and objects, and with actual purposes and backgrounds, etc., etc. There is never, the nowhere is never there. There's corrections for, for, for biases, there's corrections for stuff like that, uh, but there's never a nowhere. But that has become how we started reading it. So we got this fascinating friction about the real and the ideal, where we understand the real nature in terms of a set of ideals that we pretend to have, but we don't actually have. 
Um, the Aristotle's unmoved mover became our laws of nature. But laws of nature are not things. They're not out there in the world to be, to be experienced somehow. They are general, generalities or universals. They are not real things. Um, objectivity is a thing that we continually seem to strive for, uh, and maybe there's good reasons for it, but it's not there. We don't have access in any way to objectivity. Um, so those words, they, they, are, they are stories of an ideal world that we uh, use to measure and understand a real world through. And this is a, a dialectic between the ideal and the real that is as old as the ancient Greeks. In this table that I made, you see a number of words, you could add a lot more, uh, where, where Plato already talked about the world of forms and the world of matter, and the world of forms is always better, uh, but yeah, you can't really get there. And Christianity, that may have been heaven and earth. Uh, you always have to be in heaven with one foot somehow, but you're also still on earth somehow, and that leads to constant confusion. In science, we've just translated those concepts into objective and subjective. Um, but that also plays out in terms of universal and concrete, or in terms of the modern, the global, or the local. Or, if you will, in terms of gender, the male, the masculine, and the feminine. Uh, um, or, the, in many ways, in the post-colonial world, the white and the non-white. Uh, or the human and the nature. So what we ended up doing through this confusion, and let me iterate here, I'm not, I'm not bashing science here. Uh, this is not against science, and certainly Latour is not against science, but this is about a story about science, a narrative that becomes a foundational story of Western identity um, that, uh, that, uh, that we have used to create a civilization of. We ended up de-animating nature constantly understanding nature in terms of a regular clockwork system in which there was no effect that actually did something, where nature never had any real agency, had nothing to do, just passing on the regularities of the system. And now we're confused, because nature actually says no, it responds, it does stuff. Uh, and we didn't see that coming. Why not? Because we were blind to it. We simply understood nature in different terms. So Galileo's, and yet it moves, now becomes, huh, and yet, and, and, and yet it is moved. It actually can be moved. Nature can be made to respond to us and step into some form of a relation with us. So all of a sudden, we're freaking out because we're seeing that nature no longer is a stable clockwork mechanism a background playing field against which only we have agency, but actually that in the Anthropocene, nature itself has become an agent of its own right. The point is not that we should create a sort of a new narrative in which we celebrate uh, uh, the, the, the spiritual value of nature or something like that. We do not have to animate nature in any way. We just have to stop de-animating it. We stop, uh, st just have to stop pretending that it doesn't have agency of itself. And what we find when we stop de-animating nature is what Love Love calls Gaia. And Gaia is a story about nature in which nature responds, has agency, um, has a, a role to play in relation to itself and to humans, elements of nature. Latour puts it like this, Love Lock is asking us to believe not in a single providence, one story about nature, but in as many providences as there are organisms on Earth. Such a distribution <coughs> of 
final causes is not the emergence of a supreme final cause, but it's a fine muddle. This muddle is died. We no longer have one story about nature that through which we can explain everything. Universals that are always true everywhere. No, we have to look what happens on the ground. We have to look what happens in certain dwelling places in order to get a feel for what is going on. Because nature um, is consistent of thousands and thousands and thousands of agents all doing their own thing and keeping their all it's, uh, themselves in certain kind of balances, in frictions, in conflicts, and it's, it's a mess, it's a muddle. Um, and that muddle is going to be fundamentally different here than there. What those balances are and imbalances are, are not to be understood through the gaze of, of a simple uh, 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 universal laws. Um, all those agents do a little more or a little less or a little different than what they're being pushed to. Right? So the cause and effect story isn't the billiard ball story. The nature always adds or subtracts something in that process. And therefore you cannot understand it as a clockwork mechanism. You have to look at its, at its actual uh, uh, workings. It is always local in a sense. So Gaia is not objective in the sense that it's a set of objects that are there at our disposal and that we can just problematically make into things. Um, Gaia is not objective so that we become the only subjects. No, the whole distinction between object and subject, ideal and uh, real, that is the problem. That, that keeping those two apart. Gaia is actually where those two start falling back together. And where we have to figure out what kind of subject we are and what kind of subject nature is, or element of nature is. What kind of subject Gaia is. Latour talks about this. He, 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 he wants to, to, to get a new account of what an object subject is. And he says, a subject is not how does he say? Being a subject does not mean acting in an autonomous fashion in relation to an objective context. No, being a subject means sharing agency together with other actors who else have also lost their autonomy. If I am subjected to you, and you, you are subjected to me, that is what makes us both subjects. That was what makes us both agents. That was what makes us both meaningful actors in the world. So we humans and a shitload of other non-human terrestrials were all subjects. And we gotta figure out somehow how to wiggle that. So we have to come down from the heavens. We have to let go of that being aloof high up in the stars. We have to let go of the high grounds of, of objectivity, of nature as a thing, uh, speaking about global uh, things. But we also have to let go of our understanding of who we are, uh, our self-understanding. We are not the only actors on a passive stage called nature. We are terrestrials. Latour, I didn't bring in the quote, oh, maybe I'll do the next, uh, next uh, uh, presentation, when Latour says, uh, uh, we, we probably should let go of the word human. Um, let's call ourselves terrestrials. And then we are terrestrials among other terrestrials. Um, and let's figure it out from there. And this means that also that we have to do something with science. Um, not that science is wrong, but the way we narrate it and the way we hang it up on sort of those universal concepts. We have to use our science to start getting to those conversations with nature, uh, with Gaia, um, and see uh, what, what happens there. Always understand our science to be a human project, uh, a, a great, beautiful human project. So this is death. This is what needs to die. It's a crisis, the climate crisis. A crisis 
is never a matter of things. A crisis, a proper crisis, is always a breakdown of a story. Um, Ariel Klammer, a friend of mine, he always says, a crisis, what happen a crisis is what happens when <coughs> your story about yourself breaks down. And, and then you are storyless. You're, you're, you're without a narrative. And you're, you're completely lost. You don't know who you are anymore, but then you also don't know what the world around you is anymore. Anyway. But the stories that we have that break down, they always break down for a reason. It's like with wisdom tooth, teeth, right? So, so, so the old tooth has to go out because there's a new tooth already emerging. Stories break down because there's always already a new story growing. And this is a new story of the story of the Anthropocene. The story in which we have a different kind of relation to, to nature. So we, we need the crisis. The crisis is one that's going to be wholesome in the end, somehow. So we've got to learn how to die. We've got to switch our stories, so to say. Max Weber, the German sociologist, distinguishes between uh, understanding and, and explaining as two modes of knowing the world. Explaining is standing at a distance uh, and then uh, and, uh, literally the etymology of explaining is uh, flattening out before you. So you, you know the world, you, you can look at it from above, and you're at a distance from it. You make it flat, somehow, and you're above it. And of course, understanding has a completely different set of associations with it, where you're standing under something. You are, you are immersed in it. Um, um, you're looking at, at it from within. Our story of nature has been one of explaining, where we were above, and we were seeing all those beautiful regularities, but we were not <coughs> getting a sense of what is really going on. We were actually missing that because we were high up in the clouds. Um, understanding never gives you the full picture, never gives you a complete knowledge of what is going on. But it gives you a real engagement with it. You have to engage with it because you're in it. You are no longer separable from it. You will no longer have a view from nowhere. You are actually having to wrestle with that stuff. Both of them, according to Max Weber, are science. There's a, not one is science and the other not. No, both of them are somehow science. Right. Um, and of course, you can, you can sort of try to mix them, but it's always complicated. So we're going from an explaining story to an understanding story. We're learning to understand. But understanding is a difficult process because you have to let go of all the knowledge that you thought you had. Uh, you, you, have to, you have to let go of all the certainty that, that the view from nowhere, the, 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 the strong, the strength of the objective and universals and the generalizable would give you. And Verstehen is the German word for understanding. And literally it means something, uh, if you separate the two parts, like re-standing. It's uh, getting towards a new way of standing, losing your stance Losing your balance, falling, so to say, and then from that falling, getting up again. Um, and then finding your own new position in it. Verstehen, understanding, finding a new ground. So learning to die in the context of climate change, I would say, is to, to start using the crisis to really get a deep understanding. So what that looks like, uh, we'll, uh, we'll figure out in two weeks. Uh, but for now, I think um, this is it. <laughs>